Welcome to FieldLink. I'm your host, Bill Smith. We've all heard the saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And in this episode of FieldLink, John Iverson, a branch manager from upstate New York, discusses the complexity of raising apples that are insect-free and eye-appealing for today's conscientious customers. Plus, we catch up with Helena Turf customer Kelly McDowell from Augusta, Georgia, and Helena Professional Products Area Manager Dirk Doyle from Texas as we discuss how COVID and the recent home building surge has increased the demand for professional turf services for homeowners across the nation. We deep dive into what drives homeowners to lean on full-time professionals like Kelly at Fairway Turf to meet the demands of today's homeowners. We'll also travel to Nashville to catch up with Jody Lawrence for the latest news in the commodity markets. We'll discuss how the Midwest drought and the prices of crude oil is impacting today's commodity prices. Finally, make plans to attend the Innovation Expo on July 18th in Memphis, Tennessee. The Helena Products Group will be featuring the latest in innovative products and technology that will help you maximize the yield on your farm in a sustainable and profitable way. Ask your Helena representative for your VIP ticket to attend this exclusive event. Now, stay tuned for FieldLink. And now joining us on this episode of FieldLink is John Iveson. John is from the state of New York, and John is very involved with apple production. John, welcome to FieldLink. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. John, tell us a little bit about you and where home is and a little bit about your background. Well, home here is the western part of upstate New York. Um, I, we're not quite an hour outside of Buffalo, believe it or not, a little north of, if you can imagine that there is such a place, um, north and east. And uh, um, our, our branch where I'm located is right along the southern coast of um, Lake Ontario. Okay. And, and, and you, you have a wide range of crops. For folks that are not familiar with that geography, you raise a pretty wide range of crops in that particular area of New York. Certainly. Uh, what you brought me on to talk about today is a, a section. We have a certain section of apple production. We benefit from the frost protection given to us by Lake Ontario for that. Um, but also interspersed among the several counties in the area are uh, is dairy production. We have an ethanol plant. Um, we have a large processing vegetable uh, industry in the area, as well as uh, people that do fresh fruit and vegetable production. Uh, so it's it's a wide range of things that we get to deal with. Yeah, and, and tell us a little bit about your role, John. Uh, uh, home is uh, obviously in that area of western New York. Did you grow up that area? I did. Um, I, I grew up in this area in, um, in, a, in a little town. Um, I started my career elsewhere. I actually, actually started working in the apple industry in Michigan in 1992. Migrated my way back to Helena uh, over 20 years ago and back to here. Excellent. Well, John, we're excited to have you join us here today on FieldLink to share a little more further insight about, you know, the geography of Western New York, but also talk a little bit more about apples and some of the production uh, practices that are taking place there. Um, tell us a little bit about the apple industry in Western New York that you're directly involved with. It's been a it's been a dynamic, you know, industry. New York is the second largest uh, apple production state, I believe, in the country. Um, and uh, it's been a good, solid industry for the growers. So therefore, those of us that help caretake that crop um, have, you know, can make a career out of it, if you will. Yeah, and, and there's a lot, a lot of different types of apples out there uh, from from the processing side, but also the, the 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 consumer side. Which one is most impacted in your part of New York? Well, certainly the Honeycrisp. In our backyard, uh, we. I believe had the largest single producer of Honeycrisp apples this side of the Mississippi. And so that apple variety in particular has been a game changer for the industry in terms of supporting, you know, revenue to those growers as well as providing just something that's a total uh, new eating experience for the consumer. And so it's it's great when you can can develop that variety through various production systems and learn its nuances and uh, get it to market and then know people will enjoy it. Yeah, that de- that variety definitely has got a got a special spot on a lot of retailers or grocers rather, uh, you know, shelf space, correct? It's it's very popular from my understanding. Yes, sir, it is. And uh and it's 
and it's nice that you can have something that people want to purchase that has value, I will tell you that it is not a very grower-friendly apple to produce. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's got some issues. <laughs> What, what, what are some of those issues, John, you know, for those of us that are not completely familiar with apple production? Well, the consumer would love to have a perfect uh, color, shape, uh, blemish-free fruit when they go to the store. Um, so one of the calls from producing that apple will actually be a calcium disorder called bitter pit that can frequent that variety. So we try to really stay on top of the nutrition in a particular orchard like that. So it'll be from... Uh, soil calcium through the life cycle of that fruit all the way through using some of our, our foliar uh, versions of calcium to continue to to repeat that as a treatment to try and manage that blemish, if you will, that, that can get on a honeycrisp. Yeah, visual aspect of that fruit is really important, isn't it? That, that There's a tremendous amount of value in that for that type of product. Sure. I think the consumer is is paying a premium for that special piece of fruit. They want it to look nice. Um, and they want that, that eating experience. Um, you don't want to have to eat around a portion of an apple for, for any reason, <laughs> even if it is just a little bit of a calcium deficiency. Yeah. And it can be, you know, like you said, it could be more cosmetic, but still, you know, uh, appearance is really, really critical. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, we're fortunate at Helena to have a lot of solutions for growers. Yeah, that's a great point. We've got a lot of solutions in the arsenal there to, you know, help those apple producers overcome some of those challenges. One of those challenges that's very common also is in insects. And, uh, you know, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's summertime um, uh, across North America and insects are really, you know, creepy crawling all over the place depending upon the crop. And certainly uh, apples are, are, you know, not... Uh, fully protected from uh, some of the insects. What are some of the insects that uh, apple growers in your area are dealing with today? The, the key driver in the summertime for us are a complex of, of insects we call the internal fruit worms. And they, do, they, they perform just like they sound. They get inside the apples. Um, moths lay eggs on the exterior. Those eggs hatch, and those, those apples head for the seeds and do a lot of damage on the way in and the way out. Um, so... We, we have to spend a lot of time, energy, and, uh, and, and use insects in an appropriate manner to try to prevent any of that. So, so what's the impact from, you know, this type of worm on, on an apple crop? I mean, if an apple crop has those kind of worms, it's, is, it, is it pretty well discarded or, or devalued in a lot of ways? Yeah, there's a few that can, you know, if you're a fresh fruit producer, you know, apples are going to go across the grading line, and there are there's a lot of technology today to try to sort out the good from the bad, and uh, many of those will be caught before they ever make it to the consumer. But but it's just so much more important to prevent any of those apples from making it into a bin at harvest time. So we we've got to be very diligent about protecting the fruit. So how do you go about that, John, at, at your branch in terms of helping growers protect that plant from, you know, these types of insects? Well, there's at our branch, there's four of us that, that scout for um, apple producers across a three-county area that, that we help. Probably on a schedule of seven to 14 days, somewhere in there, we are making a trip through those orchards, making sure there aren't any problems. As you scout, there are different tools that we use, whether it's just evaluation visually or we use traps that can um, track moth populations. Those help us time sprays. So when you see an increase in moth uh, flight, that helps time when we need to, to apply an insecticide to prevent, um, the, um, prevent a hatch or prevent those larvae when they hatch from doing any damage. Yeah, and I think one of the moths we talked about earlier when we were prepping, uh, the coddle moth, that's, that's a pretty common one. Is that correct? Yes, coddling moth has been around as long as apples have been. So they, it's interesting how, how things evolve together. <laughs> so <laughs> They kind of side by side, huh? So it's a pretty common moth in, in, in apple crops then. Yeah, all the way across the country. You know, it doesn't matter whether you grow them here or Michigan or Washington or Arkansas. There's, there's going to be coddling moth around the apple production, for sure. Okay. And, and how do they impact that crop? Uh, is it more aesthetic? Do they go in and, and do a lot of damage as they turn into uh, a worm? Yeah, that one is more than just uh, 
aesthetic because you know that that worm will burrow its way into an apple um and again doing a lot of damage on the way in and the way out when it exits so that is 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 garbage when they're done with it that's for sure what what are some of your solutions then uh john with uh, calling moth and, and and other insects too for that matter so under you know under significant pressure which is kind of what you have when you have a lot of apple production all in one area um it's 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 not unusual to get a significant pocket of 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 high insect pressure you know we attack these pests just like other producers will of other pests across the country we need multiple modes of action of insecticides in this case obviously that that will go after the pest in different ways to keep something new and different in front of those or just rotating families of those chemistries so we'll we'll start with a certain family of chemistry at, at, against uh, against them in June. That may transition in July, and then a different family of chemistry in August, if that makes any sense. So, uh, what are some technologies that you guys are using in your area? I, I think you've got some uh, new things that you're kind of exploring with d- different ways to trap and try to get ahead and better understanding these uh, particular insects. Sure. So if you think about it, um, you know. A three-county area across our region might not sound like a lot of time or space, but we'll have one person on Mondays check traps across that area and put 200 miles on a vehicle and tie himself up for a full day. Plus, he has to record all that data and then get it back to us and the customers. So one technology we started to use this year is a a camera trap. Um, One of our suppliers, FMC, they they make an insecticide that we use called AltaCore that uh, is is used commonly by us in our calling moth management programs. Um, so instead of that person having to physically look at every trap, we can, from the office, take a look and see if we've got much of a flight going on that week. Send us alerts, and it's, that's really helpful. So that's one technology that we're, we're utilizing in addition to, to scouting and just general trapping. So basically we can use this digital technology to monitor a wider range of uh, I guess geography to get ahead of some of these flights and and eventually maybe make a better prescription if if needed and or make ourselves more efficient. So yes, I, I agree with you that those things can happen. But um, I look at how our manpower is getting used because if, if I, it's not that productive to be looking at a trap and counting moths if that person can be looking at trees and looking at other things. That's that's probably got a little more value ultimately. Yeah, I think that's a great point. It's it's not that you're, uh, you know, looking at the trap and doing counts like that is an important piece of evaluating a, a apple crop. But there's a whole lot of other stuff to be looking at too, uh, as you mentioned. You know, there could be some calcium issues. There could be some root issues. On and on and on. Correct. Yes, um, it's there are a plethora of diseases. There are other insects, uh, a tremendous uh, number of things that happen in what I call an orchard ecosystem. You know, we've, we've managed crop load. Um, if, if you can envision it, every apple as it blooms, every bloom can turn into five apples. And if you had a tree full, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't grow an apple any larger than a pencil eraser. So we have to manage that crop load through plant growth regulators to help decrease the yield, if you will, or the number of fruit so that they will make size so customers will want to eat them and that we'll have something to sell at the end of the year. Yeah, it's not like a, hey, let's put the tree in and then magically we have these, you know, pretty red apples that we all see, uh, I guess, on TV or whatever uh, up here. There's a lot of work and science put behind it, correct? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. I, I love it when uh, when folks come to visit us here at, at Helena and, and once in a while they want to plant trees in their backyard and ask how to take care of them. And I, I strongly encourage them to save their money and go buy their apples at the store and let the professionals handle it. <laughs> There's definitely a lot of work to it. You know, uh, John, you know, we were talking earlier, uh, you know, certainly a lot of insects popping up right now. And you talked about Troubadour. Troubadour being an insecticide of choice that uh, fits a lot of producers in in your upstate New York market. Tell us a little bit more about Troubadour and some of the 
power behind that product? Well, if you recall what I had mentioned a little bit ago in terms of how we manage um, coddling moths specifically, I mentioned that we need to use multiple modes of action. And in rotating that class of chemistry, I think is an important tool to preserve the chemistries that work, but also to, to manage the insect population so we don't have breakthroughs. Troubadour is another unique family of chemistry for us. Um, it's, it's not getting used only once a season, um, but that really gives us a powerful tool that we can direct right at cotting moth, for example. It also picks up a, another group of insects called the leaf rollers, which can be very important. It's very effective on those. Um, and it, again, just adds, adds to the arsenal of products to choose from. Yeah, and I think that's a really great point. Like you mentioned earlier, you know, this is just one tool in the tool belt uh, or arsenal, if you will, of, of products that spread out some diversity uh, in chemistry to keep some of the, you know, the longevity. So we don't have products, you know, insects becoming, I guess, uh, uh, you know, not so much uh, effective, uh, uh, you know, losing efficacy over time. And uh, Troubadour certainly helps add to that mix of products. Sure. I, like I mentioned in the beginning of this, I've been doing this since the early 90s. I've seen products come and I've seen products go. And it's, it's, it's something I try to talk to people about because everybody wants to gravitate toward the cheapest thing always. And I've said, okay, that cheapest in the short term may not be the cheapest thing in the long term. We've got to incorporate other things into the program. So if we always have these conversations. Uh, I think that's a really great point, especially uh, on a, per, you know, a somewhat of a permanent crop like apples. Uh, you, you know, apple trees, you get that, uh, you know, that crop established. Um, it's important to have a good plan, a, a strategic plan that spreads out your uh, insecticide strategy so that you can spread out that e efficacy and, and be effective uh, in controlling, you know, the pest long term. Absolutely. That's, that's exactly what we do is we kind of have a planned approach um, from beginning to end. We anticipate what the problems will be, confirm um, the, 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 the product we put in the field is the one that's working and doing the job, and, and we have to anticipate what's coming next. So that kind of helps you build what you think the program is going to be well before the season, and then you tweak it as you get into the season and see things change. If they do, John, you know one of the other, you know dealing with all of the insecticides as well as other nutritional products, the apple crop really does have a, a wide, uh, I guess, range and demand of different applications. Talk to us a little bit about kind of your go-to adjuvant program. What what kind of adjuvants are you utilizing on you know some of these applications, such as insecticides, in, in your crop rotation? Well, adjuvants. Um, can be, you know, a very important part of a tank mix uh, strategy. Um, there are certain products we're using at times that, that require, you know, water conditioners. So Quest is in that same family of Request and some of our other tools, but um, it, it uh, buffers the solution as well as, as, a, hard wa as a water conditioner to, um, to, to prevent any any hard water tie-up, if you will. So Quest is important in a lot of our plant growth regulators, goes in a lot of tanks. Um, and then we rely more on the, um, the other adjuvants for improving coverage, for uh, reducing evaporation, to try to get that performance that we need. And there's a lot of things in those tanks. So, you know, making sure we have compatibility is another thing that those adjuvants will bring. We probably don't talk about that enough. To your point, yeah, compatibility is something that often gets overlooked, but you're mixing, in some cases, some pretty complex um, um, tank mixes, correct? Yeah, you might have a couple of fungicides, a couple insecticides, plus then some nutritional products in some of these mixes. Um, you know, you think about the cost of labor and diesel fuel, uh, you know, producers need to be efficient with their operations. Um, and so we have to make sure that we have uh, mixtures that are safe and they're going to perform the way they want and, uh, um, and they get the job done. So we spent a lot of time thinking about that. Our, our lead products are, um, are uh, there's, there's a spreader sticker called Cohere in our lineup. Um, and I, I, we've really adopted a lot of that over the years. Um, it, as the chemistry has changed from the, uh, the early part of this century, I guess, when we used to have pyrethroids and organophosphate insecticides that, that, uh, that, that we were counting on performing, the new ones are translaminar type 
compounds that are meant to dry on and get in the leaf and and have some systemic capabilities. So you don't you have very different expectations about what you want that active ingredient to do today than we did 20 years ago. So that requires a different adjuvant um, to consider in some of those situations. So cohere is a, a part of our program with some chemistries. Um, there's there's a fairly new uh, adjuvant called hyperactive. I, I don't know that it's new with Helen anymore. It's new to some customers. Um, part of our one of our intern projects a few years ago, um, one of our interns put it out side by side with a competitive product, and we had some pretty profound performance improvement um, using hyperactive with some of the more um, finicky insecticides, I guess. <laughs> and so we adopted using it a couple of times a year, and we'll find fits for adjuvants when they. When, when it makes sense for us. Yeah, John, I think that's a great point when we talk about adjuvants and, and some of these complex chemistries and, and diverse chemistries that they all have a different purpose, a different goal. And you'd like that chemistry has a different purpose and a different goal. So do some of these adjuvants. We need to utilize their, you know, uh, chemistry uh, uh, benefits to our advantage. And, and, and it's important to have a wide range portfolio because there's really not one size fits all, especially in an apple crop. That's true. And I, I know it's frustrating for customers. When I have four different adjuvants, I will have prescribed over the course of that season, but it's the right product for the right mixture at the right time. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. The right product at the right time for the right situation. And uh, that's really, really important uh, for growers to understand that um, there is a wide range of adjuvants out there. And, and you, as a trained professional at Helena, are, are trained to, you know, identify the right adjuvant for the right time. It's about identifying those adjuvant characteristics, understanding the characteristics of the chemistry and making sure we get that marriage right. Yeah, I think that's a great point. It's all about having the right marriage at the right time and so forth. John, what are some of the other uh, challenges that uh, some of your customers are dealing with right now as it relates to apple production? Well, in, in 2023, it's frost. Uh, we've, we do have a little bit of damage on the crop this year that we're going to have to work through. Um, the, the, the Lakeshore guys, uh, we literally do have growers that farm right to the water in, on, the, on the shore of Lake Ontario. Those guys are fine, but um, the production that's about – uh, 10 to 15 miles south of there um, definitely got hurt by by a, a cold snap a couple weeks ago. So, um, you know, that, that's the that's the latest stress, if you will. <laughs> well, how, how do growers in those geographies, to your point, uh, that had some, you know, or I guess would be springtime frost uh, at an untimely uh, situation, how do they overcome some of that? What are some of the solutions around that? Or are there any? Probably the best solution recently is crop insurance programs. Um, the, that, I, you know, there's there's frost mitigation technologies that people have tinkered with for generations that sometimes work and sometimes they just spend a lot of money on them. So I don't know that there is a good solution for that. If it happens more often than it should, you probably have an orchard in the wrong place. Certainly, you've got uh, quite a lot of apple production there in western New York that you're certainly involved in. And as you mentioned earlier on the front, you know, state of New York's probably set number two uh, in total apple production. And I know when I lived in New York, uh, I mean, boy, there's orchards everywhere throughout that state. And I know a lot of our listeners often think of New York as, uh, you know, New York City, but boy, there's a lot of agriculture in New York, and I think it's important, and I'm really glad to have you on the FieldLink podcast today to share some of the insight that you have as far as apple production in the state of New York. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Yes, we're a long ways from the city here. <laughs> Quite a, what are you, about five, five, four or five hours? Uh, probably more like seven uh, from here, but I can be in Cleveland in two and a half. If that, if that gives you a little bit more uh, perspective. And, you know, and I tell people all the time, uh, in my lifetime, usually we go west, not east. <laughs> so I've, I've been to Chicago more than I've been just New York. There you go. Well, it, and it's a little more challenging drive uh, to go east than it is west, that's for sure. But, uh, well, John, uh, is there anything else you want to share with our uh, listeners today about apple production, uh, uh, insect uh, management uh, in apple crops for this year? I would say no. I would tell you, though, that uh, 
I tell the audience the apple a day keeps the doctor away. I definitely believe that and it will sure help my customers. Well, we definitely want to help support agriculture and certainly those growers that you're working with on a daily basis in Western New York. So John Iveson, uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us today here on this episode of FieldLink. Thank you. And at this time, we welcome to the uh, FieldLink uh, studio is Jody Lawrence. Uh, Jody, uh, welcome to uh, FieldLink. Bill, it's great to be back. We've had a lot going on in the last two weeks since we spoke, uh, weather being the main driver of everything that's going on. And uh, this is the double edge of the sword when you get to June and July in the U.S. growing season that people want the crops to get off to a good start, get a good stand and have great potential but they also want high prices and this is where you start giving up one for the other and it's been uh been so dry in uh, all of may and in a lot of parts of the corn belt it was the driest may on record and you know but you don't have to go back too far to remember 2012 and if you start throwing in parallels to that where we sit now on June 13th, uh, the, you know, this becomes a really dicey and explosive situation. Yeah, definitely a, a, a wide range of weather out there. Certainly it's been pretty dry throughout most of the Corn Belt. You get down uh, to West Texas, though, uh, where it was dry and it's been dry for a long time. Boy, they're getting a lot of rain down there and it's changing the game a little bit as we get through the Delta. Certainly a lot of moisture that's been timely here in the last uh, few days. So, yeah, a lot of wide Disper- uh, a lot of lot, a lot of change across the country in there yeah you you especially look at the southern plains and i know everybody down there that did have a wheat crop would uh, have traded about another week to be able to harvest everything that they had the cotton guys were happy and you can kind of see that in price that it can't decide whether it's getting in or getting not because the crop that got in was getting off to a good start because it did get some rain and now it's getting far more rain than they're used to at this time of year on an early crop. So yeah, the, you, very regional, but that is just part of the system that's set up. You've got the uh, jet stream that's dipping down and all of that rain is hitting Texas, Southern Plains, Oklahoma, Arkansas, across the Delta, and then it's breaking it off and going north into the Canadian prairies Uh, where they're getting more rain already than they did last year. But unfortunately, the expense is the middle of the sandwich, which is a majority of the U.S. Corn Belt, uh, just just so dry and only some marginal accumulations of some uh, you know, pop up showers and one little system that we saw last weekend with no real pattern change or soaking rainfall expected. Uh, any time in the next you know week to ten days, which you know you, we're reaching cri- critical time moisture needs for corn, and uh, if this doesn't change soon with pollination starting always around the Fourth of July at the earliest uh, places, this year's crop we have to remember got in earlier than average, one of the best in quite a while. And if this this pattern doesn't have to continue all the way till the end of July, if it's still hot and dry a month from now when we've just had some basic just keep the crop alive type rains, then pollination may be majority complete in a month, which would be a couple of weeks early, simply because planting moved across, uh, moved along so quickly. So, uh, you know, it, it all, it, it, there's always a moving part that when you get one good thing, it creates a potential of another problem. Jody, certainly a lot of, oh, uh, you know, different situations agronomically out there with weather. How is it impacting the grain markets today? Well, you look at uh, what corn has done. Corn has been on an absolute tear since it made the uh, 490 and three-quarter bottom, <clears throat> excuse me, on May 16th. Uh, so so you look in the last month, uh, you've had corn, uh, December corn put on uh, almost 70 cents because we traded today to a new uh, almost two month high at 559. And we know that the corn market had been 
uh, trading, trading lower, trending lower, overly bearish. We had a big yield number out of the March report of 181.5. We had a huge uh, Brazil crop that was hitting the market and our exports were poor. And then all of the sudden, if everything started going well, which it was for planting, when this shift occurred, everybody was caught on their left foot uh, when the curveball came in. And you can see now we're making, uh, we're about to trade over 560 for the first time in quite a while. Uh, on December corn, and uh, you know, you look at uh, s some of the old market uh, things that you think about. That of the, I think the, I think it's 17 years, but 17 of the last 17 years since we've had the revenue-based crop insurance. At some point over the course of the growing season, the price of December corn went back over that price, and that price was set at 5.91 and a quarter, and if it doesn't rain, I would say 591 uh, very easily in our sites. If not, uh, you, you know, and if it doesn't rain, you've got to look at everything that happened last summer uh, as the crop began to fall once harvest began, you know, once we started to get that feel for it in August that, you know, we could, this could be deja vu all over again, uh, you know, uh, almost one year later. So. It's uh, it's you know, uh, it's unfortunate because uh, I'm in the camp as well as everybody with Helena. We would love to see big crops and figure out a way to market them, take advantage when the opportunities are there, because we know what the tail of uh, or how long the tail is for a major drought and the other problems that it creates off of the ag system. You definitely, uh, you know, weather impacting that price and, you know, prices look good, but to your point, we've got to have a crop to go with it. Jody, let's switch to soybeans. How okay. is the weather impacting the grain markets for soybeans right now? Well, soybeans have been dragging along. And as we sit there on Tuesday the 13th, you've got November beans up 36 and you've got July beans up 40. And those are the two biggest days that they've had uh, it, it probably back to uh, it, in all of 2023, at least for the last several months. And they're really uh, you're looking at firming cash basis in Brazil, which means that uh, they finally may have chewed through all of the, their un, uh, all their crop they don't have bin space for. And also you're getting some uh, kind of uh, quiet uh, Chinese demand coming out of the Pacific Northwest for both corn and beans. So uh, generally firmer cash markets, but also you've got uh you know you've got the fact that you're at a, a a critical beginning to kind of pod set also in the bean market looking at this weather that uh it, even though beans can can uh curl up and uh, play possum for a little bit longer than corn they can't go without moisture and <clears throat> you know, for too long and expect to have a full crop. So, and you also get a little bit out of whack because before today you had 560 December corn and $12 November beans. And that was a little bit of an imbalance when you look at uh, everything that's going on in the world and where we are in June. So uh, beans, uh, bean oil, uh, certainly a strength, the renewable biodiesel industry, the Biden administration is expected to put out their updated mandates on and RENs uh, by the end of this week. And bean oil has really been the best of, uh, of the best looking of anything inside the bean market. Uh, it's unusual that a bean oil, the bean oil contract could lead could lead the bean uh, complex for any length of time, but you certainly have the potential if that if all of that demand hits the board, like everybody says this summer. And definitely a lot of opportunities yet for soybeans. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, some of those alternative uh, resources really popping up with the uh, administration around the Green New Deal, so to speak, uh, driving a lot of that behavior there as well. So uh, certainly a strong demand. Hey, Jody, let's talk a little bit about the Black Sea. Um, we've seen a lot of transition, you know, a lot of, a lot of hype, a lot of noise, uh, good and bad, uh, as it relates to the Ukrainian 
Ukrainian uh, situation with Russia um, in the Black Sea. What's your take on that? Well, I think as everything over there relates to the export potential for Russia and Ukraine, what we found and what the crop and everybody from the beginning of the war really overestimated was Russia and Ukraine's ability to find alternate ways to ship things out because although Ukraine's crop is going to be sharply diminished this year simply because of lack of supplies to uh, plant the crop, what they grew last winter harvesting right now, they're being able to get out through train through Europe even though that it's not being sold domestically, they solve those problems. So they're sealed and going to the ports to other places to sh- be shipped back around to the North African uh, c- countries that are still food deprived. So uh, whether Russia r- renews or doesn't renew the export corridor is really just becoming white noise to all of the trade simply because they say they aren't going to do it right up until they do. They've renewed it three times. So uh, while wheat has got its own set of problems because of the weather, uh, when you look at uh, the European wheat crop and also the developing Ukrainian and Russian wheat crop in the Northern Hemisphere, we are going to talk less and less, if at all, about the Black Sea Export Corridor deal and how it impacts. But sadly, as predicted, the spring offensive from both sides has brought that war back up to a fever pitch, and you feel horrible for everybody involved and uh, you know, just hope for some sort of humanitarian end to it so, as soon as possible. Definitely. And uh, certainly that kind of transitions over to the oil situation as it relates to crude oil. Uh, lots of global um, trades taking place right now as it relates to crude oil and certainly impacting you know the agriculture market here in the United States. Absolutely, because Uh, When OPEC announced back in February that it was voluntarily cutting Saudi Arabia in particular, uh, cutting oil production, crude shot from $74 up to $82 a barrel. And it's been in a steady decline since. We got down as low as $67 uh, within the last 10 days of trade, shot back up to $74 when uh, Saudi Arabia announced that they would be working on additional cuts because this is now the you know the balance of of where crude oil market is. Uh, even though the stock market's been up six of the last seven weeks, the fear of recession is still painting the global picture of flattening demand for crude. So you've got crude at sixty nine. Uh, dollar at 69 and a quarter uh, right now on and you have got to hope that the United States strategic reserve is being refilled as they promised here since it doesn't seem to want to break too much lower but uh, as long as the recession and what the Fed is going to do I believe they're meeting this week again on interest rates and what the economic numbers look at, that's really the barometer for oil, whether it's going to be trading at 67 to 72, or we're going to see that breakout back towards 80 or above. But I'd certainly be with uh, July diesel and uh, diesel through the summer down here at some of the lowest levels in a while at 239 a gallon on the board. Uh, Keep topping off your tanks because at some point this, uh, you know, you've got to figure higher prices are coming. Yeah, definitely a lot of movement in the energy area, specifically around crude oil. Uh, It's not going away, folks. Uh, Definitely want to keep your eye on that one. And as you mentioned, Jody, uh, take a position. Uh, it might be a good opportunity to fill some of those tanks, uh, you know, for, for the next round, so to speak. Jody, anything else uh, left here on uh, Field Link that's going to impact growers here in the next few weeks? No, we're just in a full-blown weather market. And if you uh, go online and look through weather models, the European model has been much more consistent and much more accurate than the GFS model has been. So don't get too excited or too bearish if you see the GFS trend wetter because it has been, but it's been wrong where uh, the EU model 
has stayed consistently dry would just pop up showers and my biggest concern is we're heading into another three-day weekend with the uh, new holiday of Juneteenth being celebrated and floating around Father's Day. We have the markets closed on Monday the 19th, so that's another three-day weekend weather market waiting to unfold for us. So uh, a lot of volatility. Uh, you, you hope for rain and you hope to be able to take advantage of when these opportunities pop up. And certainly uh, with corn uh, 70 cents off the lows, uh, everybody needs to be watching the newsletter for uh, for when I'm looking and seeing adding some additional sales uh, to it. If, the, if we see a decent enough weather change where we know everybody's going to be in good shape. All right, Jody, want to thank you for joining us on this episode of Field Link. And folks, if you're interested in getting that daily newsletter that Jody talked about, reach out to your Helen representative to learn more on how you can get the daily newsletter from Jody Lawrence. Thanks, Jody. Thank you, Bill. And welcome back to Field Lane. On this episode, we're excited to have some folks joining us here in the uh, Field Lane studio here in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, we've got the Central Area Manager uh, for Helena on the professional side of our business, uh, Dirk Doyle. And also joining us, a great customer uh, out of Augusta, Georgia, Kelly McDowell. Guys, welcome to Field Lane. Thank you very much. Hey, Thank great. You. We're excited to have you here today. Uh, I know you guys are going through a lot of training. You have a lot of discussions amongst your organizations and uh, really trying to grow your professional side of your business. Um, uh, Dirk, tell us a little bit about what you guys got going on right now in, in the professional side of the business as a whole. So a lot of growth. Um, we treat or we sell to or we service the golf market, the lawn care market, pest control. Um, we do a lot of IVM, forestry and aquatics. So there's a lot in that conglomerate that we're doing. Um, our biggest uh, growth market right now is definitely the lawn care side. Um, in different parts of the U.S., the economy's doing great. Homes are being built. Sure. More and more lawn care companies are popping up. But the existing lawn care companies are doing great, just like what Kelly here with Fairway Lawns. A lot of opportunity. Um, excited to see some new products come down the pipe to help these guys with mm -hmm. safer applications, more efficient applications, to help them promote their business a little bit better. Right. Um, it's a great industry. Um, there's obviously challenges in it, just like what we have within Helen on our ag side. Sure. But um, it's definitely a, a wide open growth market for us right now. A lot yeah, of excitement. Definitely a, a, an expanding market. And, and Kelly, uh, joining us here from Augusta. Uh, Kelly, tell us a little bit about your business and what you guys do. What kind of services do you provide your customers? Okay. I, I'm, I work for Fairway Lawns. You know, we're a, a lawn care company. So, you know, we, we develop a program to go out and we're going to handle all your pre-emergent needs, your weed control needs, your fertilization, insect control, disease control. So we're going to do everything on the, uh, what we call the feeding aspect to make okay. sure that you have that lush, green, clean lawn that you're looking to achieve. Sure. You know, we have different programs for different markets. You know, we run from Texas all the way to Florida with our branches. So it's, uh, it's very diverse. Each market's a little different. Each turf type's a little different. So, you know, our specialty is, is making sure we're developing that proper program for that specific turf type. As Dirk mentioned, it's a growing industry. The We're seeing homes popping up everywhere, you know, expansion, especially in the southeast part of the U.S. Correct. The, and, the south is, is a strong market for what we do. You know, people have realized the value of our service. Uh, they can go buy some of these products at your local big box store, but they also realize then they have to store them, they have to apply them. And and they see the value in, in what we charge and having us come do it. And, you know, it goes back to if, if they pay us to do it and something goes wrong, we're going to come correct it. They're not left with a bad situation. So it's a, it's a tremendously growing market. And it really, the, the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. when that kicked off, it really exploded. More people were at home, more people were seeing what we did and realizing how their neighbors had that great lawn. So that's, you know, if anything good came out of the pandemic, for us, that was it. We've had tremendous growth since then. Yeah, so Bo's that homeowner just, you know, they're around a lot more, so they wanted to appreciate what they had right in front of them. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. Excellent. So uh, certainly the uh, home ownership, you know, as we take a look at price and interest rates and home building, I mean, your services are probably becoming more and more involved 
on the construction side of the business too, as more homes are popping up around the country. Correct. We, you know, we have certain managers that work with builders. You okay. know, where that builder once they you know install a lawn or install a landscape, you know, they'll recommend us as the provider to take care of it, especially for that first year. You know, just like anything that's young, the first couple of years are going to determine the entire future. So. It's a, it's a tremendously growing market right now, for sure. You know, uh, I know you work in the Augusta area. We were talking, you know, before we started here about, uh, obviously, everybody knows about Augusta for the, for the golf tournament and so forth. But a lot of those residents in that area, they rent out their homes during the tournament, they correct? Do. That is a huge business. And, and then they call you sometimes, hey, we need help. They call us. Unfortunately, they call us a lot <laughs> late. Um, you know, generally we'd love to be out there that fall to prepare it for the spring, but we'll get sure. a call a month before I'm renting my house. Can you come back my yard green? Well, you know, it's 40 degrees outside. The nighttime temperature is still cold. So the, that ship has sort of sailed in that aspect, but we'll try to educate them and let them know there are certain things they could do. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a big one. You know, they want those homes to look good for their guests because they get big money for that. Yeah, that's definitely appreciates the home value as a whole, taking correct. care of your lawn, correct? Correct. It's a, it's a huge appreciation. Yeah. I mean, the first thing people see when they're looking at homes is the outside. Yeah, and obviously the lawn's a cornerstone of that, the landscaping that supports that as well, also a very important part. And I know, Dirk, you support that entire space. And it sounds like uh, this whole area is really growing for Helena and across the in entire industry. It is. And, and like I said, he, he's in the south. I'm, we're in the Dallas area. Mm -hmm. And Dallas just seems to be growing leaps and bounds day by day. And to be honest, we see more lawn care companies like Fairway pop up right and left. Um, every one of those companies are telling me they experience 20 to 30 percent growth every year wow which is phenomenal for any kind of business i think but um i think what you mentioned earlier about the you know the green part of the lawn and everything i think there's a lot of personal satisfaction that comes out of that whether a homeowner does it themselves or they pay a company to do it uh, you have a, a fairway lawn come in and, and do your lawn you show up at home and it's it's kind of a prized possession in the neighborhood you know right. you, you're keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak. And sure. that seems to be a competitive edge that helps our industry more, that everybody wants to have their lawn look a lot better than the, the guy next to them. So for Helena, that gives us a lot of opportunity to continue to dig in and find the new products that are going to help these guys with cleaner lawns, um, healthier lawns that, that are last better in drought situations. Um, just provide a lot of opportunity for them. Today, we're providing a lot of training for them to see some of this new technology that's coming down the pipe to make their company a little more efficient, give them better opportunities to apply safer products and um, and achieve that green, healthy, Augusta-style turf that everybody right. wants to see. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And, and you know, you, you touched on some really important things, and I think this translates even to the homeowner. Uh, in my opinion, we're coming out with products like Resgenix, which is a water management tool for, you know, for uh, lawn care professionals and homeowners and, and folks in the ag business for that matter. It certainly ties off to a lot of this emotional space of I'm going to have a good quality lawn, but I'm also going to be sustainable in that process. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, earlier, Kelly, you talked about working with some outside groups that helped you better understand your business and some of those emotional things that drive a consumer or a homeowner to, you know, uh, why do they want to do business with an organization like yours? And what are some of those tips? Correct. So, so we did an interesting study that involved a lot of market research, consumer surveys. And the number one reason or the number one thing that consumers were looking for was a kid and pet safe product. You know, mm. we were really surprised at that. We all thought, you know, I've been in this business a long time. We figured it would be price. You know, we thought price would be number one, but, it, you know, everybody wants that safe product that still gives them the results they need. And, you know, that's where we work with Dark. You know, they get us the, the lower use products. You know, the, the product industry has changed tremendously since I've been in it. Sure. So you're seeing, a, you know, a lot of products now where it's just such a low amount of active ingredient, but mm. it still has the effectiveness you need. And that is, seems to be the direction that consumer wants to go. You know, they want it to look good, but they, they want that low footprint. 
Well, I think uh, that's a great point. You know, if you step back and look at a lot of marketing studies, you know, people are driven by emotion. Mm -hmm. And you touched on it earlier. With COVID, people are around their homes a little yes. bit more than they have been. And I think that drove a lot of behavior. And everybody seems to get a pet today. If you go to the grocery yeah. store, the yeah. pet food aisles are huge. Yeah. And uh, making sure that that pet, it's an extension of the family a lot of cases. Absolutely. And, and you know, we also offer flea and tick services. So, oh, wow. you know, that's a that's a big uptake for our customers, you know, to help keep the, the new since pests down, as we call them. Uh, mosquito control is, is something that uh, is just a booming segment of our market. Uh, everybody, if you live in the South, you know what mosquitoes are, you have mosquitoes. So those are, those are two great products that, you know, we have available in our list of services, and we're seeing a lot of other companies start to add those. Um, but here again, we get to use, you know, low volume products, Lot, lot less footprint, so the customers love them, and we still get the great results with it. So, Kelly, uh, you know, as a homeowner, uh, and I know that uh, you can certainly go to, as you mentioned earlier, at the big box stores. We can pick up some of these products, and um, for the most part, and and get them down. But for me, uh, it's timing. Timing's everything. You are so correct. Um, it's something we preach to our customers. What we apply is important. When we apply it is almost, if not more important. Mm -hmm. Certain products have to be at certain times to get the intended results. And, and if you're off timing, then you're almost wasting your time and your money. So they call us, they're on a program, you know, our software does the rest. We're coming out when these, <clears throat> these applications need to be made to make sure that you're gonna get the, the most bang for your buck, if you will. So it's, like I say, the, the most homeowners are really starting to see the value of our service. Um, interesting to learn a little bit about some of these other additional services, you know, the tea and, uh, flea and tick uh, uh, prevention. You know, again, it kind of ties back to that homeowner that may have a pet and how do they control that? You know, it's taking care of Fido, right? Yep, that's exactly <laughs> it. And the kids, and the kids, you sure. know, not just the pets. You know, a lot of people spend a lot of time outdoors, especially in the south in the summers. You know, it's daylight till nine o'clock, um, sure. which is the prime time for most of those nuisance pets. So it's, it's been a huge service add-on that we've had. Um, and we're really just now breaking ground on it. So I expect to see the, the results of sure. that, you know, grow exponentially and rather quickly. So, guys, I would wonder, uh, I mean, with a lot of tr people in transition today, more probably so than ever, meaning moving from maybe New York or up north to, to the south or uh, from way out west, California to Texas mm -hmm. and some of these areas, uh, we're seeing a lot that, that's happening all here in Tennessee. Uh, we've got a lot of people transitioning. So when going through that process, we're dealing with different lawns and different turf types. What's some advice for those folks that are in transition, maybe going to a new market? I'm one of those people coming from the north down to the mid-south. I mean, I've got a whole different type of lawn that I'm right. just not used to managing. What, what's some advice that you can share with our listeners? We see that so often. So, you know, we'll have people from up north move to the south. And the first thing they notice is in the south, your grass goes dormant in the winter. They're not used to that. They're used to green grass year-round. You know, I tell customers when you move or when you're looking to hire service such as fairway lawns, Always make sure you know two things. What kind of grass do you have and how much square footage do you have? That is how most companies are going to determine your price, your program, and the applications to be made. You know, those are things I would say a lot of it you can find on Google. You can measure sure. your own yard. But if you have that knowledge when you're shopping these services, it's going to help you out tremendously to make sure you're getting the service that your yard needs, <coughs> not just a chicken soup approach. Yeah, de definitely a good point there. And like a lot of things, you know, uh, how, how does how does Fairway Lawns, how do you go to the customer? How do you market your services generally to the homeowner? So, we, you know, we do a, a combination of digital marketing, of course. Mm -hmm. um, we do what we call brochure mailings, which okay. actually they're like a postcard. Sure. Um, you know, we capture 85% of our customers for the year in a six week period, okay. usually between mid February to early April. You know, that's when everybody else, our competitors are doing their mailings. So, you know, we're mailing out, we're doing digital marketing. Some of our markets, we do billboards. We do have some TV commercials that we've had prepackaged that we'll run. Um, you know, so we're aggressively seeking those sales. We don't just sit and wait on people to call right. us. Um, and then, you know, then we'll go out, we'll give them an estimate, a consultation. We'll look at their loan, let them know, you know, what our program's going to involve mm -hmm. and, and the part that they need to do, which is just as important because, you know, we're one part of a three-piece pie. You know, yeah. you've got your fertilization, your mowing, and your watering, and we only handle one part of that. So we're, we're going to educate them as well and set their expectations accordingly. 
Oh, that's excellent advice for all of our homeowners out there to better understand, you know, how do we prepare as approaching companies like Fairway Lawns and others out there across the country. Right. Uh, d- Dirk, um, what kind of trends are you seeing, I guess, really in the Texas market up through the central uh, part of the United States? Are you seeing some similar trends like uh, uh, Kelly seeing here in, in, the, in the Deep South? Oh, absolutely. Um, I don't think there's a lot of difference between his South and, and our South West sure. as far as that goes. Um, you know, back to the, the question you asked came about people from the North moving to the South. We sure. have a lot of that. We have the California coming to Texas. We right. have them coming from the North. Um, there's a lot of agronomic differences there. So mm-hmm. Kelly's point about knowing what kind of turf you have. Uh, a lot of people may think you can just go buy a bag of fertilizer at Lowe's or Home Depot and sling it out and boom, you get the perfect yard. Right. There's a lot more to it than that. Sometimes you can, but for the most part, sure. you need that professional advice from somebody like Fairway and Kelly to be able to give you the direction of what's what's really happening in that lawn. Let them treat it, let them apply it, and let them find the issues you may be facing. Um, as far as the trends we're seeing there? You know, I guess one of the things that I see uh, kind of question about, you know, we talk about f- different fertility programs and herbicide programs, insect programs, but sometimes it can go even deeper. Um, tell, tell us a little bit our, our, from the soil perspective. You know, a lot of different homeowners have different soil types. You know, we talk about transitioning. I know coming from um, Iowa, where we had eight foot of topsoil to here here in the Delta, where I've got about an inch and a half, uh, and it's all clay, it's much different. And I'm sure that's true in both of your markets. Right. Well, that gets back to that agronomic thing. So, like we said earlier, there's a lot of new homes being built in the Metroplex. And a lot of these builders, they may put some bad soil back in and they may put good soil. Right. So the numerous lawn care companies that we've worked with will call us and say, hey, I've got this troubled yard. So we'll go help them diagnose it, look at it, see what's wrong. A lot of time it's a just a hard pan clay there. So the homeowner's having a hard time getting water irrigated. The turf may be stressing back from drought. Mm-hmm. Um, just can't, no root growth at all. So there's products and options that we can offer for that home, that lawn care company to right. help address those issues for that homeowner. So it's a win-win for, for both sides, but we are all three sides, really. Helena wins, the lawn care company wins, and the homeowner wins. He fixes sure. his problem. So, right. But that is, if you're talking about a trend with the new homes, I would have to say that is one trend that we see with, with every lawn care company that we work with is, is some of the agronomic soil issues that they face from just the different the way they level that soil back out, it may not be the perfect soil that you want. Right. So you've got to create the, have those amendments to fix those issues. So we're able to provide that for those lawn care companies. Oh, that's great. And, uh, you know, it's a very common problem. I'm dealing with that right now myself. <laughs> so uh, I totally understand. Uh, uh, to you, the south. Yeah, it's just like, wow, well, what's underneath there? But, you know, that's the, that's kind of the, I guess, card we're dealt with, you know, a lot of rapid mm-hmm. building in some of these markets. And, yep. you know, speeds everything. Everybody's trying to beat the interest rate thing. Absolutely. So this is one of those after effects, isn't Correct. it? Correct. Yeah. Um, guys, I uh, want to talk a little bit about uh, some other consumer trends that you're seeing out there. You know, certainly we touched on, uh, you know, some of these buying habits. Uh, we talked about the importance of pets and kids. What are some other habits uh, that kind of surprised you in your study there, uh, Kelly? We're seeing a big shift of customers go to bundling services Okay. where, you, you know, we evaluate the lawn. They have pets, we know they're going to want flea and tick. Uh, they have St. Augustine, we know they're going to have disease issues. So we'll build them a package that will include all the needed services throughout the year. And then we, we're offering a subscription service, which okay. is basically a levelized payment plan where you divide their services for the year over 12, they pay equal payments in 12 month payments. Okay. There's a big shift into that. and and. You know, that comes from a lot of industries going to that. Sure. It allows for, you know, friendly family budgeting. Mm -hmm. Uh, If we have to be out there more than once in a month, you know, they're not getting overbilled and and ruining their family budget for the month. So it's just an ease of service where we're going to handle it. This is what we're going to do. You pay X amount a month and they forget it. And, And like you say, people who travel, it's a great service for them. They pay their monthly bill. They're gone. The service is done. They don't come home to a disaster that they've spent years trying to correct. So Mm -hmm. it just allows us to stay on schedule, apply products in a timely manner like we discussed earlier. And and we're seeing a big shift in our industry to that exact service. Yeah, I think that's an exciting, you know, to hear about that. For the average consumer, the average homeowner, where they can say, hey, I'm going to invest X per month into my home lawn care and I can walk away. And I'm... 
I would imagine, you know, June, July, for like a lot of us, it's going to require a lot of love and attention right. for, across most of the U.S., Hate to get that big bill that month when everybody's trying to go to the lake or go to have fun, exactly. but if you can spread it out, it's a little uh, less painless. It is. Absolutely. It is, and like I say, it, it really helps us. It's a domino effect because we're there when we need to be there for those certain insect applications or disease applications, mm -hmm. which are so time oriented that we've got to get them down within a specific date to make sure that we get the results. So that frees us up to do that without having to worry about are, are they going to have a big bill this month. So it, it's just. Uh, it's going to be a, a game changer in our industry. Wow. Exciting stuff in the home loan uh, side of the business, certainly a growing market uh, across the United States, uh, certainly in the southeast as well as in the central part and the southwest part of the United States. So uh, Dirk Doyle and Kelly McDowell uh, from Fairway Lawns and Helena. Uh, oh, guys, I want to thank you for joining us here today on FieldLink and helping us better understand the importance of uh, lawn care management for the homeowner. Thanks for joining us on this episode of FieldLink and be sure to mark your calendars for July 18th to join us here in Memphis, Tennessee for the Innovation Expo, which will be held at the Helena Products Group facilities here in Memphis. Ask your Helena representative for your VIP exclusive ticket for this innovative event.